All right, thank you, Ingrid. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a pretty scant audience here today, which is to say no one was able to attend this meeting in person. Um, but I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Sadie Carney, and I am the staff liaison to the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee, which is a statu statutorily required advisory committee to the Land Conservation and Development Commission. And here at DLCD, where I have worked for over eight years now, um, I am our communications manager and a policy analyst. Um, and as part of the policy office, I work out of the director's office. And so our director, Brenda Bateman, um, is my boss. And uh, I hope that uh, folks will find this presentation useful. This is an information session for candidates who are interested in joining um, the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee or simply learning more about what we do and why we do it. Um, I have a short PowerPoint presentation uh, that I will pull up on our screen here shortly. Um, but maybe Ingrid, I will give you the opportunity to, to introduce yourself for the record. Hello, my name is Ingrid Cordell. Oh, you're muted somehow. There you go. Oh, I can hear you now. Yes, Ingrid Cordell. Um, I am the advisory committee coordinator for DLCD, and I was maybe. Thank you, Thank you, Ingrid. All right. Well, I will go ahead and share my screen. Let me move to the top of my presentation here and get this started. Um, and then if I can come back here and share my screen. Sorry about the delay. Okay, uh, Ingrid, will you let me know? Oh, I'm sh sharing the wrong screen, I think. Let me try that again, sorry. I think it looked right to me, Sadie. Did it? Yeah. Okay, is it sharing my full screen? Yes. Okay. All right, great. Um, all right, well, uh, this is uh, my presentation, information on the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee. Um, I hope that it's useful and will answer some questions that folks may have. Um, if we have anybody join us in real time, we'll ask them to give us a brief um, uh, introduction and then I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Um, Anyway, today is December 6, 2022. Uh, it's just after 1130. We have 90 minutes scheduled for this presentation, but we may not need to take this uh, that long, um, given the low numbers of folks here today. Um, but we will post this presentation on our website uh, following the recording um, so that folks can view it um, at a time that's convenient for them. Um, we've already introduced, I do know that our vice chair, Jennifer Isola, is uh, expected to join us around noon, which is about 20 minutes from now. So we'll look forward to her jumping on and maybe sharing a few words of wisdom with us when we have that opportunity. So I'm going to advance through my slides here, um, I think. There we go. So what are the objectives of our meeting today? Um, number one is to encourage uh, a diverse pool of applicants to apply to the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee. We're currently recruiting for one congressional seat, uh, Oregon's new congressional district number six, which is uh, Yamhill and Polk County, parts of Marion County, uh, really the central Willamette Valley region. Um, it is a new congressional district that will be effective starting January 1, and we hope to have a new CIAC manor member appointed by the Land Conservation and Development Commission at their January 26-27 meeting, um, which will be their first meeting in 2023. Uh, it will also be, and we'll see this on a future slide, um, a joint meeting between the Land Conservation Development Commission and the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee. Um, I, I want to provide as much information as I can. Um, if I have the opportunity to answer questions, I'm happy to. Um, and to hear back from folks at the meeting, though, uh, I don't think there's a, a huge 
likelihood that we'll have that opportunity today. <laughs> so um, what is the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee? Uh, as I mentioned at kind of the top of the meeting, it is a, a statutorily required committee and the statutory authority under which it is created is ORS 197-160. Um, so that is within the land use laws in our Oregon revised statutes, which is what ORS stands for. And the work of this advisory committee um, centers on statewide planning goal one, which is citizen involvement. Um, and it helps this advisory committee helps both the commission and the Department of Land Conservation and Development ensure widespread community engagement in all phases of the planning process. So land use planning takes place both at the local level, um, but also here at the state. And so what we are what we are looking for an advisory committee to do in this capacity is to help us achieve some of those best practices and to really think through how we can more effectively engage community members and the public in our policy development and other matters. So how does it really work? Um, goal one is applied both at the state level, as I just described, um, but really at the local level. And that's where it has, I think, its greatest impact. So each city and county must respond to the land use goals that are applicable to the city or the county in something called a comprehensive plan. So a comprehensive land use plan um, has a lot of different elements, but each one is required to respond to goal one, citizen involvement. Um, we recognize that that term is is a little outdated. Um, we prefer the term community engagement. Um, unfortunately, uh, citizen involvement is codified in statute and would, would require a legislative change to update that language. So um, while it's something that we have discussed, we're not there yet, um, maybe someday we will get there. Um, but as yet, we, uh, we take a very broad interpretation of the word citizen, really to mean any resident that is part of a community in Oregon, pardon my dog. Um, and um, just mute for a moment. I think we got it. Maybe we don't got it. Um, apologies. Uh, so um, at the local level in these comprehensive plans, each city and county develops a local plan for how they are going to apply this land use goal. Um, people often say that it's goal one for a reason uh, and that it really is the foundation and underpinning of a successful land use program in Oregon or the successful land use program that we see in Oregon. Um, as I said, you know, we it, the the statute says citizen involvement. We prefer um, a more updated and modernized term, which we think is appropriate. Um, community engagement, and um, a local government has uh, public involvement participation plans. So there's two elements to that. Um, one is what is written into the plan. So this is what a community or a county intends to do in terms of applying goal one. Um, and the second thing is a group of people that is acting as advisory at a local level. So much like the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee acts as advisory to the Land Conservation and Development Commission, a local government must have something that's called a CCI, a community, a citizen involvement committee or a committee of citizen involvement. I don't know, it's a terrible acronym. That's roughly what it does. Um, and so each local government must designate one of these uh, committees for citizen involvement at a local level. And that committee 
does kind of the same thing that the CIAC does at a, at a state level and advises the local government on the effectiveness of their community engagement or public participation, public involvement plan. Um, oftentimes, the CCI and the Planning Commission are one in the same. That's actually written into goal one. Um, so sort of the idea was, was posited at the inception of the land use program, which is now almost 50 years ago, um, that, you know, maybe the planning commission could do the work of a CCI. Um, and maybe indeed in cases where local governments are constrained for capacity, either from an administrative support perspective, or it's just not that big a community, and, you know, you've got the same five people doing, you know, almost everything. Um, could there be an efficiency in making the planning commission the CCI? Um, and so that was kind of something that that people thought ahead about. Um, and uh, and so we do see that around Oregon. We do see many instances um, of places where planning commissions are acting as that local CCI. So those are the two elements in a local comprehensive plan, right? So there's the written piece, what the local government intends to do. And then there's this advisory body that sort of feeds back to that local governing body and says, yeah, you're you're either doing, what you said you were going to do in your plan, or you need to do it a little bit better. And there are other ways that a CCI might advise a local government, but really at, at, its, at its most basic element, that's how it functions. Okay, so I'll move on. So what has the CIAC done um, in the last couple of years? So I, uh, took some elements from our 2021-2022 uh, work plan um, and listed them out here. So each year annually, the Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee or CIAC has an award called an Achievement in Community Engagement Award. And this past year, we had three uh, communities that were honored with an ACE award for some really tremendous accomplishments um, in in community engagement, some really innovative work um, that we that we think as a committee, or really the committee thinks, and I'm speaking on their behalf, helped to define um, best practices in community engagement um, in land use planning. So really exciting stuff. Um, very. Uh, you know, ambitious community work that um, the CIEC members take quite a bit of time in evaluating and reading the application. So that is one element to um, the body of work that a CIEC member will complete. Um, we also recruited two new members for congressional districts three and five. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very happy to say that in not too long ago, I think it was maybe 2019 or 2020, we increased the number of CIAC members to a, a fully impaneled CIAC of 10 members. And that was kind of looking, I think, ahead at the creation of this sixth congressional district for which we are now recruiting. Um, and when we have um, one single new member for the sixth congressional district, we will have a fully impaneled CIAC of 10 members, which is really exciting. It's the biggest and quite honestly, the most diverse CIAC um, LCDC, or excuse me, yes, uh, the Land Conservation and Development Commission has had. Um, the CIAC routinely provides guidance uh, to the department and um, you know, letters of comment to the Land Conservation and Development Commission on the same, um, on both our policy agenda development and on agency rulemaking activities. So let me pause there and then I will unpack the policy agenda for, for, for those who uh, may not be initiated to the inner workings of land use at a state level. So the policy agenda is um, the department's policy agenda. And what it does is it lays out 
um, for the coming biennium. So a biennium is two years. Um, right now we are in the 2021 to 2023 biennium. The biennium starts at the end of the long legislative session. So the 2021 biennium began on July 1st, 2021, and it, the, it will end um, on June 30, 2023. So it, it doesn't line up with our calendar year. It lines up with the biennial budget um, for the state of Oregon. So for each biennium, so each of those two-year periods, um, starting in July and ending in June, two years later, DLCD creates what's called a policy agenda. Um, and the policy agenda is intended to be a transparent and public way of expressing our agency's intention to create new policy and develop new land use laws. So the policy agenda, one of the reasons that it comes at the end of a long legislative section is a lot of the policy development work that happens at the department is the result of legislation that has passed into law during a long legislative session. There's also a legislative session that is shorter on even numbered years, but a lot, not a lot of policy development work happens. Most of the legislation that passes during a short session is related to adjustments to the state budget. Um, and so not a lot of new policy development work comes out of a short legislative session, which is why we develop this policy agenda after a long legislative session. And a lot of what is included in the policy agenda is work that comes to us from the legislature. Um, a lot of that work could come with money. Um, it could come with deadlines. It often does come with deadlines. Um, it could come with new staff members. All of that would be captured in our policy agenda. So we have the long legislative session. We get a lot of assignments from the Oregon legislature. Um, we describe those in the policy agenda. And then in addition, to, to what has come from the legislative session, we'll include in our policy agenda um, policy development work that we have started but hasn't yet been concluded. Some of our policy development efforts are years in the making. Um, we also have, uh, if, if we have some capacity, which is relatively rare because DLCD is a small state agency, we're only between 70 and 80 people total, um, so if we have agency capacity or there is um, a very urgent need that has been identified by the department, um, we, we will include items in the policy agenda that are not legislatively directed, but come from the agency itself. Um, and then finally, so we have legislatively directed work, agency directed work, ongoing work, um, and then sometimes we will indicate in the policy agenda, if we have them, really long-term projects. And really, again, this is just a way of DLC, DLCD being as transparent and open with our intentions to develop policy um, as we can. And one of the reasons that we do that is that goal one requires us to involve the public in every stage of the land use planning process, right? So at, at the very, very beginning, um, we want people invol involved. We want the, the com you know, community engagement efforts. We want public comment opportunities. Um, and, we, and we take that public comment um, and in presenting it to the Land Conservation and Development Commission, um, we'll either, you know, we can receive feedback from the commission on changes that they would like to see based on public comment, but staff also reviews all the public comment that comes in, and we may suggest changes to the policy agenda based on the comment that we, comments that we have received from the public on our policy agenda. So that's what the policy agenda is. Um, 
And one thing that I didn't maybe unpack in terms of uh, sort of like state agency lingo, and there's a lot of it, I apologize, is um, rulemaking. So if the CIAC is providing guidance on the policy agenda, maybe now we kind of have an idea what that is, um, and agency rulemaking, maybe we don't know what rulemaking is. So rulemaking is um, what we do to help implement statute, to make it easier for local governments to look at one of these ORS, this Oregon revised statute, right? So we have a land use law and then underneath that land use law is rules. So DLCD and our commission, which is governor appointed and Senate confirmed, um, but they're not the legislature. So only the legislature can make new laws. DLCD can't make new laws, but we can make administrative rules. So when we're doing an agency rulemaking, we are updating one of Oregon's administrative rules. So we have statutes, the ORS, and then we have the Oregon Administrative Rules or OARs. Um, and, you know, the commission and DLCD is limited. There's sidebars. We can't make rules that aren't land use rules, right? We can't make rules about, um, you know, building codes because we are bound under certain chapters of Oregon revised statute in terms of where we can develop implementing rules. But those implementing rules are intended to make it clearer, easier for local governments to look at a statute, interpret that statute and apply it at a local level. Um, they have, you know, they, they are effectively laws. They have the force of law. An Oregon administrative rule is basically a law, um, but it's not actually a statute. So maybe a little bit confusing, but that's what an agency rulemaking activity is, is developing those administrative rules that help local governments interpret and implement a statute, a statutory requirement. Um, and so when we're developing those rules, we have oftentimes we have something called a rulemaking advisory committee. Um, and that is a group of people with a lot of different interests um, that really help us develop a balanced rule, right? We don't want to overrepresent one group or dismiss or disregard, um, you know, the needs of another group in our rulemaking. We really try, oh, hi, vice chair. Um, we have a very scant attendance today. So I am recording for posterity so that folks can um, watch this later. And I will pause after this slide and give you the opportunity to impart any words of wisdom. Thank you for joining us. So I'm trying to describe in my best, um, you know, sort of like stream of consciousness effort, uh, what rulemaking is. Because as I look at these slides, especially without an audience, it occurs to me that there's probably a lot of jargon on here. Um, and it is, it, I'm becoming increasingly aware of it as I stumble over these terms. I'm like, well, if somebody is watching this and there's no opportunity to ask questions, how do I describe rulemaking? Which is, I don't know how much of that you heard, but I just, I think I finished describing rulemaking um, and how we do it. And so I'm talking about how the CIC provides guidance to and direction to um, the agency on how we should advertise or communicate about our rulemaking efforts, who we might consider including on a rulemaking advisory committee, um, and that kind of input to really give staff direction and to provide feedback to our commission. Um, so other accomplishments uh, include uh, comments on best practices for community engagement for the Land Conservation and Development Commission, mostly in the form of policy and activity. Um, our speakers have been extremely in commenting on DLCDs.
Sadie, your sound has gone a bit shaky. Jennifer, have you noticed that? And will again in January. Um, and after that, it will become effective for the next eight year period. So a very, very significant document. Um, if I start to freeze, somebody just interject. I just got a message that my connection is unstable. Um, and then finally, um, our CIAC has participated with a consultant who has been retained by DLCD um, to help us develop our first DEI and racial equity plan. And um, we're very excited about that. That will be concluding, that work will be concluding and I believe we will be adopting that plan in January or in early 2023. So I'm gonna pause and welcome our vice chair, Jennifer Isola. Um, as I mentioned, Jennifer, uh, we haven't had anyone show up today, but I wanted to record um, something in case folks wanted to, to you know view it and we can sort of let folks know that the recording is out there, but thank you for taking time. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, Maybe I can stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, and maybe you could just tell people why they ought to become part of this group. How many applicants did you have? We have two so far. We normally get a little bump right before the close, um, which isn't for, when's our close date? It's, I, it's in this slideshow. It's the 9th? 12th? No, 12th. I think it's next Monday. Nice. Yeah, so hopeful. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So, I, mean, my, yeah, I know, I was like, to, it is not really like, hi, everybody, but. <laughs> you want me to introduce myself? Uh, sure. My, yeah. my name is Jennifer Isla. I am, um, the pesticides policy manager at Beyond Toxics. Uh, this is my second year on the CIAC. Um, yeah, it's it's a really good opportunity to be involved and participate in making recommendations to the commissioners um, about changing policy and um, gosh. What else can I say about it? <laughs> well, I think it's, um, I mean, one thing that I'll take a moment to talk about, because it's not really captured in this slideshow, though we've talked about it a lot internally with our group, is, um, so I mentioned budget development activities. One of the things that DLCD has submitted um, a request for in our budget. So each agency submits, um, you know, kind of their their ideal budget to the governor, um, and then it moves from the governor to the legislature. And the legislature has a hard job of balancing priorities and figuring out what is most important to invest in in the state because there's not enough money to do everything that every agency wants to do. Um, and so we don't know what the outcome of this budget request will be, but we do have a sizable budget request, um, this biennium, so this is the 2023-25 biennium I'm talking about now, um, for equitable community engagement. And uh, I think, you know, it is, it is our, you know, of, of 12 budget requests that we have submitted, um, this has the number one. They are not necessarily ranked in terms of importance, but it is, again, number one for a reason. Um, it's a real priority of the agency. And I think the work of the CIAC will have such tremendous value in terms of the input um, and the opportunity to really shape and create something that has really big potential statewide impact if we are funded in that budget request. Um, and so, you know, Jennifer's leadership as our vice chair and um, our CIAC chair, Leah Rausch, um, I just, I cannot overstate <laughs> how appreciative I am of their leadership um, and, you know, kind of their willingness to be thoughtful in this space and to really help us advance best practices in terms of 
uh, community engagement around the state. And with this, you know, potential opportunity uh, coming in the next couple of years, um, that could just be a, a much magnified effort. So really exciting possibilities and we will see um, what happens during the long session. Yeah, for sure. And for me personally, I wanted to be involved in this committee just from an environmental justice advocacy standpoint. So, and I'm the I'm the non-planner um, person. Well, there's there's several non-planner people on this committee, but um, yeah, it's just a good opportunity to be involved. And I know now you have a bigger time commitment than many of our CIC members because you are our vice chair. And so as such, um, both Vice Chair Isla and Chair Rausch are involved in some planning and prep meetings in advance of our quarterly meetings. But if you were to say, you know, aside from the time you spend in the meetings themselves, which is three hours, four times a year, how much prep work would somebody have to how much time would somebody have to set aside to to do a reasonable job of reading through the packet and preparing? I know it kind of varies, but if we were to ballpark it, what do you say? Um, a, a few hours. I mean, more more if you have a ton of questions that you want to know in advance or, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, I'll admit there's times I did not read the full packet and I did feel lost during <laughs> during those meetings, you know, but um, yeah, it's been a really good experience. Awesome. And you make you make it really easy. Both both of you do make it really easy. And um, I mean, it's really all Ingrid. Di but. Digestible information. Oh, good. I mean, that is really, that's part of the intent. And, and you know, walking through this um, slide deck, it, like I said, it occurs to me uh, just, how much you know to do a good job of communicating in a way that the general public understands um it does take time there's a lot to unpack because i don't find that um state level government land use law land use practice local government practices are generally that open to people and that's some of the work that we're trying to do at the cic is to sort of break that open for folks and to make it more accessible. So well, long-term goal. We're, yeah, we're getting their baby steps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you are welcome to stay for my whole presentation if you wish, um, but you certainly don't need to. I appreciate your time this afternoon, but I will go back to sharing my screen and um, hopefully we'll be done. I don't know. I don't know how many more slides are here. I. <laughs> you know me, I could probably talk for the full 90 minutes. Sure you can. Okay, um, well, I, I think I'm going to drop off then. All right. Thank you so much. It was great to okay. see you. Thank you. Take Have care. a wonderful afternoon. You too. Bye. Okay, so Ingrid, I will go back to sharing my screen. And then I can move on to my next slide. I have to resume my slideshow. Okay, so our 2022 work plan, um, I'll try to start moving through these slides somewhat quickly, uh, maybe for your sake, Ingrid. Um, but our 2022 CIAC work plan um, included uh, recruiting a full committee that reflects Oregon's diversity. Um, if you have applied to the CIAC or you are considering applying, you will notice that our application form includes a series of demographic questions. And later in this slideshow, um, we'll take a look at Oregon's demographics and I'll talk a little bit about what, what does it mean to reflect Oregon's diversity? So um, the, the statutory authority that creates the CIAC says that the CIAC should reflect the diversity of the state. So when we're collecting those that demographic information, all of which is optional, by the way, but it does help us create a committee that does precisely that, that really reflects the diversity of Oregon, the makeup of Oregon, um, sort of the interests, needs, et cetera, of Oregon. 
Um, so that's, that's part of what we're trying to do and really what I think we um, are accomplishing with our recruitment methods. Um, we awarded achievement and community engagement awards, um, as I said earlier in the presentation to three different communities. We are supporting and continue to support um, what I was just describing with Vice Chair Isola, DLCD's equitable community engagement work. So that started as a budget request, um, which is also known as a policy option package in state agency lingo. So POP 201 has now advanced in our agency request budget. Um, for the governor's consideration as the governor develops their governor's recommended budget, which will then uh, go through the Ways and Means Committee at the legislature and ultimately either show up or not show up in what is called the legislatively adopted budget or LAB. And that happens at the end of the long session. So all that legislative work comes and our agency budget for the next two year also comes, years also comes at the same time. Um, we have advised, uh, or the CIAC, excuse me, has advised on agency rulemaking initiatives um, and really all policy development work. So that includes uh, creation of our strategic plan and our DEI and racial equity plan, um, other things that aren't necessarily rulemaking. Um, we have proposed uh, sessions on best practices at the OAPA conference this past year and just presented at that in the month of November. Um, and finally, um, as resources and time allows, the CIC shares best practices, um, both with local governments that might submit a request or, or other kind of um, interest or community-based or community-serving organizations, um, sharing best practices with those groups um, also um, could include uh, updating of a document that we have called Putting the People in Planning or our Public Participation Guidelines. Um, we have a number of resource documents on the CIC website, which is housed on the, the Department of Land Conservation and Development website. Um, encourage you to check them out if you haven't. Uh, so moving forward, what is coming next? So in 2023, first and foremost, we will be appointing a new CIAC member for Congressional District Number 6 um, at our January 2023 commission meeting, which, as you can see in the next bullet down, is also a joint meeting with the Land Conservation and Development Commission. Um, so if possible. Uh, we do encourage CIAC members to attend the meeting in person. Uh, virtual attendance is always an option for us as well. Um, three of four uh, CIAC meetings each year, with the one exception being the joint meeting with LCDC, are entirely virtual um, and really, you know, pretty time bound between nine and noon um, on a quarterly basis. Um, and then once a year, we, we give CIAC members the opportunity to come in person. Um, travel costs are reimbursed for CIAC members. Um, and the joint meeting with the Land Conservation and Development Commission is just really a nice opportunity to have a conversation. Um, an informal lunch is provided where you can get to meet uh, DLCD staff members and commissioners in person and just sit down, maybe get to know your CIAC members uh, a little bit differently. But um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation um, and, and everything that results. Uh, so we are also in the month of January planning to announce our Achievement and Community Engagement Awards for the year 2023. Um, we'll continue to support the department's equitable community engagement work. So that is uh, that pop that's moving through. Um, and uh, you know, opportunities perhaps to uh, provide uh, public comment to something like the Ways and Means Committee, uh, you know, supporting uh, the full funding of that effort um, might be appropriate for the CIAC. Um, continuing to advise on the agency rulemaking and policy development uh, initiatives, and again, sharing best practices as resources allow. So, 
this is just a quick look at our current CIC membership. And we have one vacancy. You can see it just sandwiched here between Michael de Blasi um, representing District 5 and Zechariah Heck, one of our at-large members, um, is the vacancy for District uh, Congressional District 6. Um, you can see over here in the right-hand column, uh, we do have two members, our chair, Leah Rausch, and Zachariah Heck, um, have their first term coming to an end in January 2023. So in our bylaws, um, the CIAC bylaws, it says that CIAC members can serve two terms in a row without having to reapply. So if you reach the end of your first term and you've just had such a good time on the CIAC that you want to serve a second term, there's no need to reapply. There's no competitive process at that point. If a CIAC member wishes to serve a third term, um, we would then have an open recruitment for that seat to give more people the opportunity to serve in this capacity. Um, but both Zechariah and Leah are at the end of their first term and are seeking reappointment by the commission, which we fully anticipate the commission will support. Um, and then we will have, uh, so we'll have reappointment of two members in January and appointment of a third member representing Congressional District 6. So just a quick look, where are our Congressional Districts? Um, I kind of verbally described it at the top of the meeting, but uh, CD6 is kind of right there. Um, sort of sweeping in most of Salem and then heading west into Polk and Yamhill counties. So um, there are little pieces of, I think, I wanna say Washington and Clackamas up at the top. Um, but I think, you know, a very diverse group of people living in Congressional District 6 um, and my Congressional District. So uh, fond of it for a reason, even though it's brand new. Um, so what is our strategy with this recruitment? Um, as I said a little bit earlier, really reflecting the diversity of Oregon, getting a lot of different, um, you know, kind of thought leaders with different lived experience and expertise and paneled on our CIC to really give us um, kind of a robust grounding in what best practices for community engagement means to, um, you know, to, to a, a good portion of Oregon. We never will have the opportunity really to represent every person. Um, but, you know, the hope is that by impaneling a very diverse group, uh, we can, can make progress towards um, really doing our our, our best possible work in terms of equitably engaging our communities around the state. Um, the process for developing this strategy, we can run through this pretty quickly. Um, DLCD has defined some priority populations and these are based on what uh, our current but soon to be former Governor Kate Brown released in her um, DEI and racial equity plan that was also part of the COVID recovery work that her administration did. Um, we have checked the relevant demographics uh, using the most recent census data uh, for different uh, demographic elements around the state. And we'll take a quick look at what those are. Um, we finalized our priority populations for this recruitment. And, um, and then we have some other things that we want to consider when we talk about representing the diversity of Oregon. Um, part of that is gender identification. Um, some of that might be whether or not a person has uh, lived experience in an urban area or in a rural area. Um, all of those different interests come into play when we talk about policy development and engaging communities. And it's all really important um, for us to be considering as we move forward with that work. So having those different populations represented is an important aspect. So uh, what are priority populations? Um, 
we have identified um, Black, Native American, people of color, limited English proficiency, people living with disability or identifying as having a disability, and people living without houses as priority populations. So why are they priority? Um, these groups have been traditionally underrepresented and underserved in government practices and in particular in land use practices. Um, land use in Oregon and really around the country has uh, a pretty grim um, track record in terms of equitably engaging, representing, and providing opportunity to all different kinds of people um, and to making the government process, as I was uh, talking about with Vice Chair Isola, accessible to these people. So folks with limited English proficiency, for example, uh, may have a very difficult time understanding um, how and where there are opportunities to provide public comment on something like land use activities at a local level. Um, I see this in my own local government. We see it um, playing out in practice um, across the state. And our hope is that by engaging these folks um, and these populations, within our CIAC, we can better, we can, we can help um, these different groups gain access um, and, and sort of uh, participate in our public process related to land use around the state. So what are some of the demographics we're looking at? What does it mean to have a CIAC that represents the state of Oregon. Um, so in the state of Oregon, our median household income is $62,843 annually. Um, one in 10 Oregonians are living in poverty. 2.2% uh, of Oregonians are black. 1.8% are Native American or Native Alaskan. Um, and then you can see we continue to be overwhelmingly white. 75.1% uh, of Oregonians identify as white alone. Um, we have, this is a group we have a hard time uh, recruiting and representing on the CIAC. So if you're watching this and you are a person that is under 24, I strongly encourage you to apply uh, for this open seat in CD6 if you live in CD6. 20.5% um, of Oregonians are under the age of 24. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I think it is difficult to engage them at times in this kind of wonky public work, um, but a real opportunity there. 18.2% um, persons over 65, 15% of Oregonians are speaking a language other than English at home. One in 10 identify with a disability. And then um, you can see at the top, I didn't read through them all, but we do have a significant number of Oregonians who are identifying as Asian or Pacific Islander, Hispanic Latino, uh, two or more races, um, and then a small group of folks, um, though, though not that small, 0.5% of an entire state uh, identifying as Native Hawaiian is not insignificant. So. These are all um, aspects of our demographics that we are considering as we look at applications and look at impaneling a CIAC that really reflects the diversity of Oregon. So a few other demographic elements uh, worth considering um, are home ownership or tenure. So tenure is just uh, kind of where and how you live. Um, so how long have you lived in a place and whether you rent or own. And really we're looking at that rent and own um, difference because um, people that own property versus people that rent property have different concerns when it comes to engaging in land use policy development. Um, and I think reasonably so. So 61.9% of Oregonians own their home and 38.1% of Oregonians rent. Uh, so that's something that we look at in terms of our demographics. So finally, this is our, our full 
uh, you know, DLCD's recommended priority populations. Who are we looking for when we are, are thinking about the diversity of Oregonians? And those categories are, are all listed here. So you can see, well, youth under 25, renters, people experiencing homelessness or houselessness, low income individuals, uh, people identifying as having a disability, people with limited English proficiency, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American, Native Alaskan, Black or African American, and finally, uh, Latino or Latinx. So our form is online uh, right now. Um, as you can see, these um, applications are due by next Monday morning at 9 a.m. Um, you have the whole weekend plus an hour or so Monday morning. It's a short application. Um, it shouldn't take too much time. Certainly encourage folks to be as thoughtful as they like to be um, in answering um, some of the interest questions about um, what interests you in serving and what kind of lived experience um, might benefit the group um, if you were to, to join as a representative for CD6. Um, and also um, Ingrid and I are available uh, between now and then to answer any questions. And when we get to the last slide, um, I have the contact information posted there. Uh, so applications are due on December 12th at 9 a.m. That's next Monday morning. Um, once we have those applications in-house, Ingrid and I do the work of um, putting those into a form where it is easy for our existing CIAC members, which is the group that will consider these applications and make a recommendation to the commission. Um, so we make it easy for our CIAC members to compare uh, one applicant to another, and we also help them understand how the different applicants um, sort of help us create that the, the diverse committee that we're looking for that really represents the whole of Oregon. Um, if needed, we will conduct interviews uh, and that would be um, the CIAC members recommendation. So our current CIAC could direct staff to say, conduct some interviews with different applicants um, if it is competitive. Uh, and then finally, we will be developing recommendations for the Land Conservation and Development Commission in January. We do have, and I, I should have posted it on here and I didn't, um, we have a special meeting of the CIAC planned for the 6th of January. It's a one hour meeting. And that is the meeting at which they will consider the applications that have been received for the new CIAC member and develop the recommendations that we will then advance to the commission for their January 26, 27 meeting. And our new CD6 member will be appointed by the commission um, on January 26th at the commission meeting, but then the joint meeting between the CIAC and LCDC is taking place on the 27th. Um, so we'll give more information on that as we're moving forward. Um, and here's that contact slide that I promised. So uh, Ingrid's contact information up there, my contact information up there, um, and then a link to the website for our CIAC page. Um, yeah, and if you are watching this, thank you for hanging on to the end. Um, and thank you for your interest in community engagement. I'm gonna update this slide so it doesn't say citizen involvement anymore, Ingrid. <laughs>